There she is. Hey, I can't hear you. I'm here. Are we already recording? Well, it just started. I'll pause it real quick. Record. Ready? And we do it just Zoom meeting style, Betsy, so we can see people's faces. What's up, team? I see no face. There we go, Rob Mitchell. Let me see that beautiful Battleground Academy face. Coach Kite. Coach Pierce, I hope you're there. Coach Harrison, our West or our Mountain Time Zone affiliate there, always represented. Uh Betsy, Rob Harrison is sponsored by Nike. I just want you to know he only wears Nike. So I always feel bad when I'm around him because he's always, I'm wearing my Nike shirt today, though. I was going to say, you've got your Nike I'm on there, Heath. Because because Rob will make fun of me if I'm wearing anything else. He's one of those guys that, you know, his outfit matches head to toe all Nike. So I'll have Under Armour, Nike, and Russell on all on the same day. Well, Heath, when I was at UT, they were sponsored by Adidas. And we had to wear all that Adidas stuff that you ordered a size small and it fit like a yeah, no kidding. Large. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, when I when I first got to UTC, no joke, we were Russell. Like that was our our brand. So uh the good news with wrestling is none of us care. So hey, want to jump in here. It's 1103. Super excited that you uh took some time to uh join us today. Incredibly important topic. Uh I'm gonna be honest, and Betsy uh knows this about me. Uh, I don't love these things because I'm always like, I'm always pulling for the coach and the administrator and the, I don't love having the hard conversations, which makes me a weak leader. I've realized that, that about myself. You can make fun of me, uh, but it's good to know yourself. And I don't love conflict. Eric's on here. He knows that about me as well. But if iron sharpens iron, sometimes you got to rub it together. And this is one of those topics that I think is very important as we travel around the country and talk to ADs and coaches and athletes like this is just reality. We're dealing with it. And if it's reality, if we have some things in place to help us, then I think we can we can make some improvements. We can get better. We can protect our coaches and ultimately uh, we can protect the kids we lead. So. I am going to pull up this here and just run through this really quick. Um, I'm going to, hey, today's topic, we're going to talk about locker room management, what that is. Uh, obviously, we have a guest on here. I'm going to introduce her really quick. The importance of system protocol. This is a top-down approach. We can't give people a speeding ticket, and I'm talking about our coaches here. Uh, we, can't, we can't hold our coaches accountable to a standard that we've never set. And so I think so many times we're just so distracted that, again, I got hired as a young head coach. I didn't even know there were speed limits. I mean, I was just wide open, out of control. Uh, that's that's not a good thing today. Uh, what are those speed limits? How can we set them? What's the importance of educating all of our audiences, not just our coaches or not just our parents or not just our athletes? Let's Let's do an all-encompassing. And then the importance of reporting. I know that's a scary word because it seems like, well, we're trying to get people in trouble. Um, I know this when I'm driving and I pass a cop and I'm going the speed limit, I wave. Uh, when I'm normally passing a cop, I'm going over the speed limit and I panic. My heart rate goes up. And so how do we create an environment that's a little less stressful? Because we all we all know the rules. And so our guest today, Betsy Smith, great friend of mine. We've collaborated a ton. You're going to see some curriculum coming out here really soon uh, with us on camera together talking about these things. And uh, Bet Betsy's a rock star. She was a Division One athlete. She's a wife. She's a mom. She's living these things. She and I talk all the time about our own kids and like the struggles there. And so she realizes the difficulty and the challenges there. She served as Director of Student Conduct, uh, Title IX Coordinator. So I say all these things. She's an expert. 
Now, here's what I know, and we've even pushed back a little bit here. Eric's on the call. We've, we've talked about this a lot. We don't want to shoot the messenger, okay? So I'm going to defend Betsy today. She's here to help protect us, okay? And so as we talk through these things, I was in a room full of ADs yesterday, and they were talking about some new regulations. I didn't even have anything to do with it, but I wish I would have had my phone on panning the room just on the facial expressions of these people. Uh, because we can get uptight about something that we probably shouldn't be as uptight about. That's that's all I'm going to say. Let's just talk through these things. Let's get better. And let's try to put our people in a position uh, to be successful. And so I am going to, Betsy, I'm going to let you um, do your thing. And so you start us off. Let's, let's dive in here and uh, let's talk through some of these things because I know it's important to you and it's important to us. Sure. So first of all, thanks for making me sound really scary, Heath. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was scared. I'm scared of her too. So don't be up. No, I'm just kidding. Oh my gosh. Stop it. Um, no, I'm, as Heath said, I'm Betsy Smith and I do Title IX and um, hazing prevention and discrimination prevention work uh, across the country all day, every day. It's been my, um, my days in this world and my evenings. I coach, um, I coach swimming. And I was an athlete at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, I was a swimmer. I was not a basketball player. It'd be way cooler if I played basketball there. But um, what I want for, for you all to know about me is, yes, I'm an attorney, but it is my goal always to not sound like one. Um, I want to talk practical. I want to make it so that we are able to um, do the work and make our kiddos feel comfortable and make our coaches feel comfortable in doing um, this hard work. So Heath and I have been working really hard on some hazing prevention stuff, uh, conversations, hard conversations, setting those speed limits, as well as um, locker room, which is a part of uh, a part of our hazing issues, right? And so I think for me, it's about controlling the controllables, and you know we have to put in measures to make sure that our athletes are safe. And we as athletic directors and um, administrators have to make sure that our coaches are prepared to do that. So from my perspective, um, what we would ask of you all is that you um, ask your coaches what their standards are, that you provide them with options, you help them with their speed limits, and then you let them work with their athletes individually or, or within their individual sports to say, hey, how are we going to be even better than those expectations that we're setting um, as a district or as a school uh, in and of itself. So um, letting your athletes have a say in it as well is going to be so important. So Heath, I'm going to shut up and let you ask me. A yeah, specific so so let's question. start, let's yeah. start here, Betsy. What, why is it so valuable? I mean, and again, we, I was in eight different school systems over the past three days, uh, all over the state of Georgia, the importance of establishing protocol from the top down, like a system level approach. Here's what we know, and, and we we sell this when we're out on the road. Like, there's a strategic plan for math and English. Like, an English teacher doesn't get to decide that her class is just three hours today, or they don't get to decide, well, hey, I'm just going to do away with this curriculum or standard. Why is it so important as an administrator to set some baseline? Now, if I'm a coach, I want to exceed that. I want to I want to go above and beyond because I want to win championships. Some coaches say they want to win championships and they don't. But how can we? How can administrators establish like some baseline protocols for their athletic department when it comes specifically to locker rooms? Talk about the importance of that. Maybe some simple practical things they can do. Yeah. So one, it's important that we're being consistent within our district, right? And so a lot of what I do is come in on the back end when there's been a situation. I much prefer to be there on the front end and to have conversations like I'm having with you all, but I often come in on the back end to say, hey, what went wrong? Well, we weren't being consistent across our district. We may have one coach who's really strong, one coach who's brand new, one coach who's really, really old school, right? Who's acting as if it's 1980 and here we are in 2024, expectations are different, right? So we have to set those expectations for all of those coaches and explain those expectations and hold them accountable if they're not following, you know, our guidelines. So what you got to control the controllables, right? You can't always control the locker room as it was built. So some of you may have old buildings that you're working with to try to figure out 
you know, how do we make it safe in 2024 when in 1980, when it was built, we were really focused on, let's say, privacy. <laughs> um, and, and we have these cinder block walls and you can't hear or see anything. So what I want you to do as a top down is have an evaluation of every locker room that you're using. Where do the risks exist? And so you have to do this as the administrators to say, hey, where do the risks exist in these locker rooms? And then create a consistent plan, but also help them create a specific plan for their locker room. Because you may have one high school in your district, brand new locker rooms, state of the art, set up with all of the things in place to make it a safe environment, which we'll talk about what kind of a safe environment means and looks like. And you have this other one where there's no windows and all the doors um, are super heavy. You can't hear a thing and it's, you know, crazy stuff can happen in there and nobody would know about it, right? So you need to make sure you know what you're working with and then control that environment and set the expectations based on what you're given. Um, I think what I would make sure that you're setting them up with a plan for supervision. So what does locker room supervision look like? And I often hear oh, well, I don't want to be in the locker room staring at kids because I'm going to get in trouble for that. I'm not asking your coaches to go in the locker room and stare at anyone. I'm asking them to supervise and to make sure that their ears are open and that they're in the same environment. So set up a desk in the locker room or an office that has a door open um, that they can be working at, doing other things. So set that expectation as um, an entire district. This is what has to happen in our locker rooms. Look, I coach swimming. Y'all like they're already like half clothed. And then I have to figure out how to go into a locker room while they're getting ready or set those expectations and not be invasive with them, right? So set your expectations, explain what that means for them. Ears open. Um, if you're hearing anything inappropriate, you're calling it out. How do they report? I think we're going to talk about that later, but how do they report if there is something that goes on? And then also um, help them with locker room time limits, right? Set time limits. How long should your athletes be in the locker room? If we're going over five to seven or eight minutes, like it's just too long. Get in, get out, get on, right? We're just setting them up with opportunity to have bad things happen. So district down, we need to set those expectations. And then when the coach gets called out by a parent for, let's say, being too strict, they're able to point back to you all as the administrators and be like, hey, man, look, like this is the this is the district rule, right? And because we don't want to put so much pressure on our coaches for all the little things, right? Some of the stuff we can just take off of their um, responsibility and, and take it on ourselves. So also locker rooms should be locked when they're, um, when they're not in there. So what, um, how are you making sure that that happens and setting that expectations? Do your coaches know it? Are their athletes going to hang out there in the middle of the day on their free period? Are they going right after school when there's no other coach or, or someone there to supervise? So setting those baseline expectations on the front end is so important for consistency. And I'll tell you the department um, of education, when they come in to look at situations to determine, you know, whether the school violated any um, protocols, that's what they're going to look for. What, what did we put in place? And if we didn't put anything in place, they're going to say, why, mm -hmm. right? Like why at a district level, didn't we do it? And, and I want to, I want to say as a former coach, I mean, and I worked for some incredible people. Like, I feel like I worked with awesome people. In 20 years of coaching, no one ever talked to me about the locker room. Like, and I, I've said to Betsy over and over, I'm embarrassed to say, but like my locker room protocol was like, hey, guys, don't be an idiot. Like, come on, we got to be better than this. And I appreciate you laughing down there, Coach Fanny. <laughs> but uh, like our Coach Owens, I mean, it is. It's it's funny. But like, guys, that that will get our coaches run out of this industry. Uh, because when as soon as and I've said it over and over the past few weeks, Eric has heard me say it. We either change by design or we change by disaster. As painful as changing by design can seem, it pales in comparison to changing by disaster. And the last thing we want is for a very good coach to get caught in a or caught up in a situation where 
we can't defend them or they can't point to the fact that, hey, all these things were in place. This kid truly chose to act out in a rebellious way. I'm not dumb enough to think, listen, I'm raising four kids. They're all stupid, man. Like my kids, they just do dumb stuff. And I'm trying to be a good parent. But if I don't have any rules, I don't need to be surprised when they do it. And so the protocol is not, it doesn't immunize us from mistakes happening. What it does is it insulates us from carrying the weight of those mistakes uh, if they ever do come to a surface and hopefully we prevent some of, some of those things. And so I've got a cheat sheet because we've gone over all this. I'm going to give you a couple of things really quick that Betsy actually walked us through. You're going to have access to all of this when you uh, when you actually get your new curriculum in May. But the first thing is make sure your coaches are locking your locker rooms. Uh, the, the old days of, hey, let's give them a key. I actually argued with one of my buddies probably about three months ago about this because his kid wanted to go to the locker room and his coach wouldn't give him a key. And I'm like, listen, times have changed, man. Like that is not a good decision. Like a high school kid doesn't need to have a locker room key walking around the school uh, because Heath Esslinger was a pretty good person, but I could do some dumb things. Number two, Eric Phillips, who, who's on the call, one of our co-founders, first person to ever, ever bring this up in my life. Locker rooms need to be timed. Eric was a state championship coach. Timing your locker room is a, not about limiting your children, your kids. It's about setting them up for success. If you want to have a great culture, then you have to have protocols in place. There's got to be boundaries. And so in your school system or in your department, you have got to communicate all locker rooms are timed. Maybe football's a little longer because, you know, they're putting on like, you know, you look at your sports and go, hey, who's having to like armor up? There are other sports where maybe the time limit's a little bit shorter because you just know, hey, they're going to get dressed in two minutes. An extra 10 minutes is just an opportunity um, for disaster. Making sure our, our locker rooms are monitored in some way, shape, or form. If you just did those three things, you set yourself up for major success. Um, major, major success. And so um, let's talk about Betsy. Talk about the importance, and you and I really have, have cultivated this and tried to do a good job here of educating everyone. So who else outside of the coach do we really need to have these conversations with? Yeah, so we need to have it with our athletes. And I always say, make sure that you're posting it early and often, what your expectations are. So obviously our coaches need to know those expectations, set those expectations, but post them in the same way that you want your speed limit posted. Because I don't feel like I should be held accountable if I'm speeding, but there's never been a sign to tell me what, that speed limit is. So if no one's ever told me what that speed limit is, if no one's ever posted that speed limit for me, then as an athlete, I'm going to be like, well, I didn't know. Right. And if you're just saying it out loud, they're gonna be like, he never said that. Post it, like put it up there, let them read it, make it short. Look, we know that they're not going to read two paragraphs, right? Post your rules and your expectations in short snippets because they read in terms of emoji and text right now. So get it up there, let them know what it is, share it, set the expectation, hold them to it. If they're not doing what you're asking them to do, do something about it, <laughs> report it, have the conversation, use the disciplinary options that exist for you, um, but make sure that you're doing something when it's not followed. And then their parents and guardians, like let them know on the front end, hey parents, um, PS, my kiddo has a coach, they're not on here, right? Um, is school coach, middle school, um, or will be middle school, the most unorganized human in the entire world, right? Like he does not communicate with parents, period. And when he does, it's a handwritten note that gets photocopied. That's what comes home. Don't be that. Also, make sure that you're telling the parents clearly. These are the expectations on your kiddos. This is what's going to happen to them mm -hmm. if they are not following those expectations. So parents absolutely need to know parents and guardians and making sure um, that you are sending that to them in the best form that, that you know. So whether it's a, you know, group needs that exist or information that's going home, however, it's going home to that specific team, make sure that they know what it is. So putting it out there to parents, I think is exceptionally important. We also want to make sure for safety purposes, that there are other people in the building 
that students can choose to go to. So who knows what those protocols look like, hazing protocols specifically. I know I'm going a bit um, past just locker room, but about who to report to and who else should understand what the culture and expectations are. Everybody, right? Like, don't be afraid to, to train everyone to make sure that they understand. Um, so your athletes and your parents, and then your school should understand the culture as well. Yeah, and I think it's important just to kind of process and when when we think about education, and we say it, if you've been on an account management call with us, like consistency beats intensity seven days a week. And so I hear administrators all the time, and I'm guilty, like, man, I'm so guilty. We go, well, it's in our handbook. Listen, man, that's like handing your quarterback your playbook and never expecting them to come to practice. Guess what? You're not going to have a very good football team. Like the old, like, well, it was in our handbook. Guys, I'm not reading the handbook. Most are not reading the handbook. And so we have to have a strategic plan. Why at a better way do we think weekly communication emails are so important? Because every week it's an opportunity to reinforce one of our values or guidelines. And so I may not do the same one every week, but hey, every week I'm going to reinforce something that's important to us. As I communicate with parents, as I communicate with coaches, as I communicate with athletes, Here's a chance for me to go, hey, let's make sure we're having these locker room conversations at home. Because as a good head coach, one of John Wooden's uh, foundations in his pyramid of success is alertness. I'm alert. I understand what's going on. And so if I kind of sense my locker room kind of moving in, it's not even gotten bad yet. I just kind of sense, hey, I hear some things. I'm going to go ahead and address it. Like before it gets bad, I'm going to go ahead and address it. So why are parent meetings so important? Because it's a chance for us to stand face to face and let them know how critical this is. Here's what I can tell you. I'm raising four kids. The Esslinger kids are not immune to being the punk in the locker room. Just because they're my kids doesn't mean they can't be the punk. And so not only are we talking to our kids about, hey, if this is happening, you need to let us know. I'm talking to my kids almost every day, no joke about, hey, don't be that punk. You take up for people in the locker room. You say these things. Again, because my goal is, how do we create championship cultures? And this is a true story. My sophomore year, there was hazing that went on on my team in high school. It wasn't crazy. I mean, I never, I don't even think twice about it, honestly. The, the normal stuff. My junior year, here's what, yeah, the normal stuff. Betsy does her uh, quotes. But my junior year, here's what I said. There's no way we will take, we will do that. Guess what happened my junior year? We won our first state championship. You know why? Because winners freaking win, man. Leaders lead. And so like some of this stuff, we've got to have conversations with our athletes. Like the old, like, hey, I'm going to be a punk because I'm, you know, I went through puberty six years before everybody else did. That's got to go, man. We got to lead. And it's our privilege to actually call out this greatness in our kids. I consider it a privilege to talk to my own children about, man, don't be acting like that. That is one. It's just, it's not attractive. All right. Two, it doesn't help your team perform at a high level. And three, it can get your butt in a lot of trouble. Uh, and so you don't think that picture on your phone's a big deal? It's a big deal. And so we've got to have these consistent conversations and we got to teach our parents and our athletes uh, to have those conversations uh, as well. And so it's 1125, Betsy, if you could, if you could give them, and we still got people jumping on, if you could give like a first step, all right? Not every step because that'll paralyze us. If you could give an athletic administrator a first step in regards to locker room manage management as a expert, what would it be? Create a plan. And I would say use your five minutes after this to like jot it down because I know your plates are full, right? So put those thoughts that are going through your mind right now down on a piece of paper where you can see it and you can get to it when you have the time um, so that next year, as the next academic year approaches, you're prepared, or as summer football camp starts, or whatever it is, you're prepared to have those conversations. Put it in writing, share it with your coaches. So create the plan, 
and then implement the plan, right? Like we can't talk about all the details in this half hour. We're going to give you a lot of those in the training that Heath and I created. Um, and we also have a podcast that we co-created coming out uh, in May as well. So we'll make sure that you get a copy of that. But it's really just start, like do something. Don't ignore this and like have a plan for them. And Heath mentioned one thing that I didn't talk about. And I'm going to say it right now because I think it's super important for you to hear. Get their phones out of the locker room. Get their phones out of the locker room, period. Implement that as a district-wide policy. There are no phones in our locker room and have a plan. Even if it's just one of those things that hangs over the door, um, like a coat. Actually, I was out of school the other day that had this and it made me so happy because um, I use it. A coat, um, like the thing that you put your shoes in that hangs over the door, put their names on it. Every athlete gets one. If you're if you're in the locker room and your phone's not there, we got issues as a coach. Like put it in place and implement it because we are seeing so many issues, sexual assault, sexual harassment, hazing. Everybody's videoing it all, right? Like it's all happening in the bathroom and it's cooler because everybody's videoing it. Like, what are we doing? Get the cell phones out of the bathroom and you will prevent it. They want that phone out of that hanging thing. So they're gonna get in and get out of that locker room. So just if, if I could give one advice as to a, a part of your speed limit, cell phones, cell phones, cell phones, cell phones. Eric, Eric, you you uh, sent me a message. Uh, speak up real quick, because I know you dealt with this. You're on mute too. Figures that'd be on mute. I, and I got to jump off here in a second. But, um, you know, what I would say is a lot of our coaches, if we get pushback, one thing I would say is rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So I remember when I implemented this, I had to make sure that I, I made the coaches understand the ramifications of the things that can go wrong and just said, man, we, as a system, we are going to do better here. Um, but you know, the coaches that are going to push back and what they're going to push back about, man, I don't have time to sit in there and do all that. Well, then set a freaking quick time to get dressed for wrestling practice. Shouldn't take more than four minutes. If you don't want to sit in there, get your butt out, get a time limit on there and get them out. And I know football and things are a little different, but another area that that I had to address was we were building new facilities and we had certain locker rooms with bean bags and chairs, which gave the appearance of this is a place to hang out. I took all chairs, bean, anything that they could sit down out of locker rooms because it wasn't a place to chill. It was a place to get dressed. Let's go chill out on the mat or on the court and the bleachers, wherever our chill out area is. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I know it can be a tough call, but getting the buy-in of your coaches for them to understand that this isn't about limiting them. It's about liberating them so they can protect their kids and continue to do their job without having, as he said, to change by disaster. So appreciate you guys. I got a roll. I got another call. So thanks guys. Yeah. Hi, Eric. Hey, I'm going to just follow off what Eric just said real quick, because I don't know about you, but my kid keeps showing me all these really cool locker rooms that he sees on YouTube. That's like all these fancy schools like IMG and whatnot. And I'm like, that is the worst idea I've ever oh, seen dude. in my entire life. But he's like, mom, look how cool this is. And I'm like, yeah, not on my watch, son. Yeah. yeah. And and we see it at the collegiate level, but here's the difference. Those, those kids are adults. You know, they're 18 years old, which doesn't mean that that stuff can't take place. But we're dealing with 14 year olds here at times. And so like our level of I feel like our level of even like. Initiative here even needs to be stronger. Uh, I think from a culture standpoint, you better be talking about it at the collegiate level, too, if you want to win. But at the, at our level that we're dealing with, like and, and nowadays, I mean, let's be honest, man, kids have walked through more stuff than we want to know about. And so we have kids in our locker rooms that have been abused and been exposed to things. And so like, it, it's not, we shouldn't run from it. I mean, who better to change their life than us as coaches and, and athletic directors and teachers and things like that. But we just have to be prepared for it. And so I hope today doesn't overwhelm you. Uh, put some things in place. Uh, I, I try not to live my life in fear. People are like, well, it's scary. I'm like, I'm not going to let fear make me run from the opportunity I have to change a kid's life. Listen, I coach youth wrestling right now. Listen, could someone say something? Yeah. You know what? I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to put things in place to create 
safety measures for my kids. And then I'm going to go try to make a difference in the lives of young people. And uh, if we think through these things, we have a good game plan, then I think we can walk in freedom and confidence to go do the thing that we're called to do. And that's change the lives of young people. And so, uh, man, so grateful for each of you. Each of you on this call, you bring us so many. Uh, I was on with an AD talking about this at, at one point, and they were like, hey, we don't even let our kids go to. And again, I don't say this because we're trying to be so extreme, but like once practice starts, you just use the bathroom hallway. You use the hall, the bathroom in the hallway. Like you don't go back to the locker room because I don't want something happening in the middle of practice. And you go, well, that kid would never do it. Listen, if you're a, I'm just going to say me. If I'm a 17 year old boy, there's things I would do that I'm not a bad human. I'm just a 17 year old boy and give me some freedom and I might do something stupid. And so Rob Mitchell would probably never do anything like that as a high school uh, young man, but Heath Esslinger might have if I was put in a position. So let's help protect our kids from even being in those positions. So so much more to come on this in the days ahead. Betsy, thank you so much for your investment in this and just your willingness to have real conversations around these areas. If y'all have any questions when we get off here, it's recorded. I'm going to chop it down. I'll send it out to you. But if there's anything, questions, comments, concerns you have, shoot us an email. I'd love to talk through those with you. But keep making a difference, doing your thing, love what you do. And it's a privilege for us to work with each of you. Betsy, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, y'all. Have a good day. Have a great day.